What's happening? What's happening? What's happening, blues people? This has been a long time coming. I've been trying to get an interview with this young lady for a long time, and by the grace of the Most High, she's finally here. Now, I need to let you know who and what you're listening to. I'm just really excited right now. This is Jack Dapple Blues Heritage Preservation Radio, and I'm Jack Dapple Blues, my man Brooklyn Blues on the NG. What's going on, bro? Everything is great. Everything is great. All right, now. Now I can get to the special guest. Miss Miss or Mrs.? Just Valerie June's fine. <laughs> Valerie June. Well, the cat's out of the bag. I don't have to say it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's my favorite song. Like, I have many, but that is my favorite. That, when I heard that, I don't even remember how. I do remember how I heard that. I was literally looking up a Charlie Patton song to learn. And I, and I was getting frustrated. And I said, well, is there any women blues musicians that I could find? And it was around the time I read, the, I think I read this article about uh, Geechee Wiley. So I was just looking up blues women. And I, I, I see this, this woman of melanin with dreads and an acoustic guitar. And then I heard the haunting sounds of the South. And I've been a fan ever since. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. Because you, like myself, have deep roots in the South. Not just being born in Tennessee, but your, your family history, right? And, and what uh, I'm not sure one of your parents were in music. Mm-hmm. And... A lot of these experiences kind of culminated into a body of work from 2006 to now, right? Am I in the ballpark? Yes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So please, let's let's talk about the humble beginnings of your journey in regards to the, the, the culture that inspired your music. Okay. I'm from Jackson, Tennessee, which Mm. is between Memphis and Nashville, Tennessee. And I I was raised Church of Christ, so every Sunday they took us to church, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday night. And we basically sang from the songbook all together, like 500 people. That's right. And no instruments, just using your voice as an instrument. And no choir. Mm. And... uh, And then after I got older, 18, I left the house and moved to Memphis. And in Memphis, I met so many amazing musicians. There were so many different styles and genres and loved music. So they all started to, you know, you're hanging out with people. You just listen to music while you're having drinks or making dinner (laughs) or whatever. So I got turned on to so many musicians from different time periods that I'd never heard of that were doing songs that were songs I sang in church. I just sang them without an instrument. Right. Like John Hurt singing Farther Along. I sang Farther Along for years. Wow. Never heard John Hurt's version until wow. I moved to Memphis. Or the Carter family singing Keep on the Sunny Side or any of the um, Lonesome, Walk the Lonesome Valley. These kinds of songs, I never heard that until I moved to Memphis. and. Wow. So it was, uh, but I sang the songs. Right. And um, so it was neat to hear the interpretation of people doing them with instruments because we were told instruments are, you can't use them. And, they were evil? Yeah, basically. <laughs> you could play outside of church, but you couldn't play in church. Inside Rarely church. Rarely would you see somebody, like, you see somebody tapping their foot, but it better not get out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> right, because that means they, they're not filled with the Holy Spirit, but they fill with the holy brown juice. <laughs> yeah, and they might start dancing, and we can't have that. We can't have that. <laughs> wow, so see, this, is, this is beautiful because this is what this platform is built on. I, I want to ask you a question because you made it clear when you were in church, you used a voice. And you also made it clear that instruments were somewhat a no-no. I, I, I would like to know, besides the spiritual belief of the church, is that also to your 
uh, belief, part of our tradition carried over because we are oral uh, story type of people. Like our voice being the first instrument. Maybe so. I never thought about it like that, but I think I think it's different for people. Different people. Um, like I've co-written with several musicians, and usually the first question I ask them is, uh, "How do you he- how do you receive songs? How do you hear songs?" And for people who started with instruments first, they didn't start singing. Then they usually start like hear songs with a guitar or whichever instrument they started with first. They might play 50 billion instruments, but the one that they started with first is the way that they usually start to hear songs. Because you hear, like, just the same way a painter can see in their mind's eye what the painting will be. You can hear what a song will be. Mm. And so I say songs come to you. And with me, I hear voices because voices are where I started, I guess. I don't know. And that's the gift that I allowed to come into my life first so usually most of the songs I hear voices first but with that song Working Woman Blues I sat with the guitar for a while and I just started to play it and that song came music first Mm. and I played that music for at least a week again and again the same you know running transy part and then after playing it for a while I started to hear the voice singing but that's a new way for me, and it opened up a new cycle. Um, so it's interesting to think about the voice being something that, like, you know, when when everything would be taken away from us, then I, we always had our voices still. True. So I can see how that would be, you know, something that we as a culture would use always as a foundation. Do. True, true. And I, I, I'm happy you brought up Working Woman Blues, which is my favorite song. <laughs> But um, a friend of mine, I had him come over at the time when I first heard it. And he was like, oh, man, he knew who you were. He's like, I love Valerie June, man. She has such a haunting voice. Said, That's a good word. That's a good word. So now bringing it back to present day, why that's a good word? Because you the haunting in regards of the, the emotions and feelings of yesteryear, the ancestors, you know, I, I don't like to use the term channeling. I don't know, but, you know, so I don't want to uh, uh, be funny or condescend anyone. But it's almost as if there's, there's a channeling from whether it's the field, the church, just the shotgun houses. Where Where is this voice coming from? It's really natural, and I'm not trying to be funny. But it's beyond natural and beyond artistic. It's beyond authentic, if that makes any sense. Do you do you know where it's coming from? Is it intentional? Is it a style? Or it's just what the Most High gave you? It's just what I've been given. I have so many different voices that come. And what I have to do as a singer is to honor those voices and try to sing the song with that emotion and the feeling that it that I hear it in the head, you know, in my head with. Um, I do hear it, and sometimes I hear high voices, low voices, what would feel like a male male voice, which is from a lower part of my body when I sing. And Sometimes I hear like a childlike voice, so I sing from a higher place, trying to always honor the song, serve the song, serve the voice, and just be a servant and say, okay, well, You know, I have to, uh, the song is sung to me this way, so I have to translate that to the audience this way, you know. I'm just, like, letting it come through me, basically, is what what I do. (laughs) It's just like, okay, let it come through me. (laughs) And then the part where I get involved is after I get the whole song, then I start to say to myself, okay, is this a song that I'll sing? Is it for me? Or do I need to put it in the book of songs that I'll, when I find the singer for it, right. I'll let them sing that one. And I choose to sing the songs that I can personalize. Like Work Woman Blues, I got that. I know what that feels like. <laughs> you know, I can personalize that. That's all I can. I'm all up in it. <laughs> but um, if it's a song that I receive that it is a subject that's not necessarily something that I see myself singing, then I just... I'm glad I got it. I'm glad right. it came to me. 
And I try to write it as best I can, but I know it's not for me. So I wait until I find a singer that it's for. And sometimes that happens. Um, Mavis Staples um, covered one of my songs for her record high note and blind boys of alabama just did one wow. um for their record that came out in in august august 25th and it's great yeah it's that's i mean great I, <laughs> that's that's almost like a young basketball player being called up by My- magic johnson or michael jordan because you're talking about mavis staples Blind Boys of Alabama, th- these are the people that grew up in a lot of our homes with us mm-hmm. for a couple of generations. So how did true. how did that feel to you when you <laughs> – how did this happen? Did they call you and it's like, hey, um, Valerie, I want to – you know, how did this happen? So many ways. Um, usually it's through people like Mavis's uh, A&R guy is Andy – Calkin and he loves my voice and my songs and in particular he likes working woman blues and he said you know Mavis is looking for songs for a new record and you are one of the songwriters I wanted to her her to hop on the phone with and wow. um and see if you have anything for her and one thing about her is she wants to sing songs that have a message and songs that are positive so that was a really neat experience talking on the phone with Mavis about which <laughs> song to send. And I sent her a couple of songs, and she chose to go with High Note. So, nice. yeah, it's really cool. Well, do, do you, considering that you allow yourself to be a vessel for these songs, um, and Mavis has a specific voice she wants to do, do you find yourself sometimes um, saying, okay, I want to write a song for this, or I, I want a song that has substance, or how does that work? What, what part, how does that work with you? Well, I'm not very good at that. I want to be, and so I write with other writers in order to try to steal some of that magic that they have of writing songs that way. I usually, like, you know, I'm better at just letting a song come, so... Running errands, cleaning the house, whatever it is that I'm boarding a plane. And here here comes a song as I'm doing that, as I'm washing the dishes, I hear it. In the same way that people who work the fields, they heard songs That's and right. they just sang while they worked. I get songs when I'm doing things, when I'm in motion, not when I say, I want to sit down and write a song for Mavis today. <laughs> no, it just doesn't work that way for me. But I sit with other songwriters, and I bring these little skeletons that I have, or which are pieces that I got just a small part of, and I don't have the other part. I've tried to force it to come, but it just doesn't. And so I sit with the other songwriters, and I say, okay, what have you been working on? They say, what have you been working on? And I sing to them parts that I've received, and sometimes they have the missing part. So mm. I think that's really cool how this world of song really isn't anybody's that you can just catch one, you know? True. People just catch songs that write them, you know? Yeah, I do. <laughs> but I think some people are really talented at writing about specific subjects. So they could write about the color blue or clouds, and they can write an amazing hit song like that. that. I'm like, right. give me some of that magic. <laughs> give me some. I want some so bad. <laughs> so, well, okay, so let's, let's, because I like to keep it heritage, but let's dive into the business of music, commercial business of music and accolades, because it it is a good feeling to be rewarded for your hard work, right? And it is a good feeling to have a million people like your work enough to buy it, right? How do you feel? When it's that time. Matter of fact, hmm, let's go back a little bit. Let's 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 step this back. The time and the process for the album. Is that back to organic, or is and then after all the songs are written, you select songs from all those that you got and say, okay, I, this is my new album. How how does that work? That's hard. Um, like, with this later, latest record, Order of Time, I had been writing over the course of a decade, and I had, like, a 100 songs, and I sent, I sat with the producer, and he was like, well, send me all the songs. So I sent all of them to him, Matt Marinelli. 
And he took the time to listen to each one, and he made a list of his favorite ones that he'd like to record. And I took the time to listen to each one again, because <laughs> some I've written years before, you know. And um, and I made a list of ones I felt were calling me to record them right now. And then we sat together, and a lot of our lists were similar, so we started with those songs. Okay. And we recorded those, and these songs don't necessarily have anything to do with each other. They happen at different times in my life, different ages, totally different work, you know, <laughs> like, what? You know? So then from there, we recorded the songs, and I was like, well, how do I bring this all under one theme in right. one record? Really, they're just songs I've written um, that I received that have totally different moral messages right, and or experiences yeah for that yeah and feelings and genre classifications right. and so how do i do that you know and i feel like we did a good job of making it happen on this record but it is like it's just one of those things where the way music is marketed it needs to have like um a a a label or right. a name because people want to name things right. in order to be able to package them and sell them, which is how we got to the point in music where black people were known to do something like this and white people were known to do something like that because they divided it by hillbilly records and race records at a certain point, and that's how they started selling it. That's right. You know, and that puts limits on what you do if what you do is colorless. Right. You know? Absolutely. You know, it's like, can you just be um, a creator? A, we all made in a creator's A person image. <laughs> who creates and dabbles in art and loves, you know, different mixing genres and colors and ages and styles and, you know, cultures and appreciates those things. And if you are, then are we fumbling around? Like, how do we sell this how right. do we market it you know and i feel like the world is becoming closer and more in the fingertips of the artists because of technology and we have more right here in our hands versus before we only had what was happening in our region and we would hear about things going on outside like right. african music i didn't grow up listening to african music but i hear african music in what I hear R.L. Burnside do or what I hear Junior Kimbrough do right. or Jesse Mayhem feel. And Whoa. so I, I can go now, today, and just listen to anything I want that's available on online from, from you know, Africa. But when I was a kid, I had to go to the library and look for a Putumayo <laughs> CD, you know. And so, like, that's changing the way artists absorb. And, and I think it's beautiful, but it's also hard to market that so i don't know well it's funny i'm happy that you went into that because you 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 mentioned what you thought about uh quote unquote genres right i forgot the exact words you use um and it wasn't anything of a negative connotation it was just that it was you're aware that there's a compartmentalization of music right and considering i'm Tell me if I'm wrong, a little bit of eclectic because you, you, you seem to appreciate all cultures, correct? I do. Okay. So now, does that cause friction in, in the business aspect, considering that the business of music is, is um, based on targeting specific groups of people in specific regions? I think it has, but I feel like it's changing. You know, because of the digital yeah. platform. Yeah. And because people have so many different genres on their iPhones, right. the listeners are changing it <laughs> you so, know? Exactly. because they have access to more versus you used to only have access to what was being played in your neighborhood, right. Right. your Literally. area. But you have access to more now. So people will have like 
black folks that have a rock and roll song, straight up hard rock song, or white folks that have a rap song, and the lines aren't so much there. And I feel like with musicians, the people who make music, they were always crossing those lines. Absolutely. They were always dabbling because music is the universal language. So it was always like, hey, okay, what y'all doing over there? I like the way that sounds. What's that beat? <laughs> oh, what's that? Oh, I like the way you bend that note. Cool. You know, and we were just like communicating that way regardless. So now it's just co- becoming even more open, I feel like, and more artists are going to be able to just be who they are. It's going to be more about like who are you as, a as an individual. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, it's funny you said that. So it's it, not funny, but ironic, because are, are we saying that it's not even just the 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 business of music because you, you mentioned a lot of things that's part of the history of music, which I'm not, I am impressed, but I'm not surprised, right? If you go back and you read a lot of uh, musicologists from the 18, late 1800s to the early 1900s, they had a lot to say about uh, black music in regards to European music and, and, different technicalities and stuff like this. I think when you mentioned bending the note, that kind of brought that up because the, um, I can't think of this German uh, musicologist's name off the top of my head, but he, he really spoke bad about African Amer- what I like to call African American tribal music, right? And blues, and it's not a music, it's not technically sound. The, the um, chord progression and everything is, 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 you know, he spoke bad about it. The, the point, what I'm asking you is, do you think the quote-unquote educate, educational elites and, and intellectuals also played a part in this compartmentalization of the music and how people appreciate it? I think so. It seems like, you know, if it had been if they figured out a way to market it that wasn't so separated <laughs> and um, and write about it that wasn't so, like, separate, then it would be, you know, people would have easily started to blend more and listen to more of different races at an earlier time, you know. So I think, you know... The, how you write about music does matter, but really it's just about people feeling it and having freedom in it, and I don't know. I just, hmm, that's one that I'll really have to think more about because there are, at the same time, while there are writers that are writing about, you know, how different it is, there are also writers who are writing about how linked the genres are because of race so mm. absolutely it goes both ways it depends on who you want to read and what you want to believe that's the truth that's the truth you know nowadays everybody's talking about fact checking and and is that a real site or is that a real article but it's it's definitely based on your belief system i agree with you 100 percent. i want to ask you consider i'm not going to tell your age but just considering the time you were coming up and doing music and the the explosion of hip-hop and and I can't, well, I can speak for definitely New York and some of the South that I've been around, but you come from musical city, so it's kind of hard. Um, I know here, music was taken out of the school late 60s, mid 70s, and you would have to pay for this as an extracurricular activity, right? Um, well, 80s, I know as, as I was coming up in school, we had to pay extra for music lessons, right? And then comes hip hop, right? Were, were you into hip hop? Was it different um, in, in where you're from? Was it um, a a hmm? Was it um, challenging? Play an instrument, uh, sing folk, blues, and everything you sang in a time where this uh, this other urban music or black music comes that is not predominantly or based on instrumentation. Was, was that a challenge? Was it met good? How, how did that work for you? For me, there's always been someone to look up to in that sense of uh, 
having somebody that was playing an instrument that was recognized for their art, like Tracy Chapman was there. Absolutely. <laughs> and Absolutely. I grew up listening to her and loved her so much. And, you know, there's just so many, um, you know, if you were in my teenage years, if I listened to Bob Marley, being aware of the fact that he played an instrument as well as singing, you know, um, and that he was writing songs. That really mattered, too. As a singer-songwriter. Yeah. So <laughs> anybody who is a singer-songwriter, I really was listening to them quite a lot because I was curious about songwriting. And um, But I listened to whatever came on the radio. I listened to all genres, and my father promoted people like Bobby Womack and Prince and Casey and JoJo and New Edition and people like that. So I listened to a lot of modern African-American uh, radio stations where he would be, pr you know, promoting most of his shows. And he listened to music 24 hours a day. <laughs> I mean, it would just be going, going, going. My mom would be like, ah! <laughs> so I heard everything. And, um, and then I knew I wanted to play an instrument. And I heard... I heard music that had beats. I heard music that didn't because I was singing in church every week without it. And I knew I wanted to play an instrument. And I was like, okay, well, I'm in my early 20s and I'm sitting here with this guitar. And, you know, the only person I knew who had played would be somebody like Lauren Hill, you right, know. And right. she learned, I guess she learned late in her life. I don't know. But that was... Um, a record that she had put out where she was playing and singing her own stuff. And I was just kind of like, you know, what I have to do is I have to just sit with this instrument and listen to more people who are just doing simple folk songs, able to do one and two chords, three sometimes, <laughs> just the simplest form. Because I'm a little starting a little late to be trying to <laughs> like Not jump on the me. Hendrix. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, Let yes. me just call, come back here a little bit, learn some basic chords and some basic folk songs. Right. Then once I got that foundation of of like learning basic folk, then I started to bend those notes a little bit. Learn a little bit of songs where you some can bend some notes. Mm -hmm. So that walks me on up from folk to folk blues. <laughs> you know, so just basically going back to the root and having it in my head that, you know, if I do 10 minutes a day, by the time I get 80, I'll be able to play like Elizabeth Cotton or Mississippi John Hurt or right. any of the musicians that I admire and respect that were not, like, given an award or accolades for their work until they were very old. Right. So my perspective on success had to be totally different than the perspective of success of modern artists. Modern artists want, you know, to just, okay, can I get that Grammy now? Right. You know what right, I mean? Right, right, right. And it's more like, uh, I don't know, has Mississippi John Hurt won a Grammy? I don't think so. <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, or Elizabeth Cotton or Etta Baker, these people who played it's, these instruments. and I still haven't seen a picture of, of, I've seen a picture of Ivy, but I have not seen, Elvie, I have not seen a picture of, of uh, just Gishi Wiley. Some of these people we don't even know. Yeah, but they are huge in the like the structure of American music, of our music, of our culture, African American culture, and it's like and American music for that. Matter. Yeah, and there'll just be like one photo of them <laughs> if there's any. <laughs> if, you if, know? That's right. That's right. <laughs> so it's just um, I was curious about how did Hendrix get to where he is. Mm, you know, so who was he standing on? Who was he learning from? Who was he studying? You know, why did the Stones fall so in love with like? American blues music. Who were they studying? Right. Because they became one of the biggest bands in the whole world. That's so how before. in the world did they do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so curious about, like, just that small, like, basic form of a song and how that grows to where those artists that I love, anywhere from, you know, Bowie to Janis Joplin to Hendrix to, you know, any modern artist that you can think of. All of it, this all roots back to this basic folk song, it you does. know? absolutely. And so I was curious about that. So that's what made me want to learn 
the instruments. I started with just a simple voice, did that for 18 years. After that, did just begin with basic chords on a guitar, then started doing the basic thing on banjo and ukulele, and it's still a slow process, small little steps mounting up to do something that is whole or Absolutely. F- fulfilled or whatever. And I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it happened basically manifestation happened a lot faster than I thought it would because I really? seriously thought that I would be very old. If you saw me when I was in high school, I was a cheerleader and I used to like you had to learn the dances yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah. They called me the black girl who had no rhythm, (laughs) like no rhythm. Like I could not keep a beat, you know, I was off on everything. (laughs) So I had to teach myself how to like I had to sit with that instrument 10 minutes a day and teach myself how to like keep time. And I would had had people like, you know, just knowing that somebody like Andy Irie exists in the world. That's wow. kind of a powerful thing. Very. She was doing her thing. That's right. It's different from what I do, but it's her thing, you mm-hmm, know? Mm-hmm. And I love that. And so knowing that, you know, people that were, there were young people that were doing it as well, that was cool. But also knowing that, yeah, these people probably started their music careers when they were kids because their parents <laughs> maybe gave them lessons or something right, or right. helped them along the way with that side of learning an instrument. But um, so I had to talk myself into it constantly, like just sit, just play, just work on those calluses. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Do I have to show you? <laughs> just so you see that? Yeah. That you, you got it too. <laughs> yeah. They should be able to identify by our hands that we play. <laughs> That's right. Because I, well, this is a, a good question. I do not like using thumb picks or picks. Certain songs I use a thumb pick for the sound because I like slide. Yeah. Right. But what do you, you like flesh better too? Yeah. I think it sounds good. Mm-hmm. I like the warmth of it. That's right. That's right. That's right. That See? makes me want to get back to my guitar. <laughs> <laughs> I dig it. I, I want to, um, I had a question, but then we got into the, the, the playing aspect. And it kind of threw me off because um, I, I totally lost what that question was, too. It was a really good question, I thought, but I, I, I lost it. It's all right. I'll come up with another question because I was excited about that. And that you have it, that you know it. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's what I wanted to say. Did that, was that instilled in you taking the long road, no pun intended, from your time in church? Because you, you, you're very comfortable in the fact that this is a marathon, not a race. <laughs> right, but, it, <laughs> but it's the truth, right? Yeah. Because of the music that we do and celebrate, you already said I don't have to repeat it. So we, when you sat down and decided, I'm going to do this professionally, were you comfortable with that, or was it because of your upbringing in the church? Because the church always taught, at least, you know, growing up, not necessarily, what do they call it now, the, um, the new church? They call it the uh, prosperity churches. Hmm. Outside of the, the, the old school churches always spoke about the long road. So do you think that was why you do think that's why you're comfortable understanding this is a process and a journey? Um, I really feel like it's more because of my parents and watching their life um, progress because uh, my father had his own companies and I watched the ups and downs of it. And my mom worked with him and and we all worked with him. And I knew what his goals were, and I knew that he was working every day towards them, and sometimes he had great success, and sometimes he had setback failures. And he was a black small business owner in the South, so sometimes for no reason crazy stuff would happen That's because right. <laughs> of the way he looked. And he'd come home, and he would talk to us about all of these things, you know. And so, and he died, you know, with work on his mind, you know, just that was his life. He dedicated his life to that. And so I just kind of feel like watching them juggle, hustle, strategize, learn how to, like, 
exist in the world and raise five kids and move through that kind of like set me up to just be like okay it's gonna be <laughs> I'm gonna have to hold on tight here because mm-hmm. if I live a long life I'm gonna be just making making it on through each step you know <laughs> and in the meantime while like dealing with the day-to-day and the survival they also taught me how to transcend and how to dream and so like being able to live in the dream world that Basically, I think ex- it expedites your whatever it is you're trying to create or manifest or live. Like if you can manifest it first in the imaginary world and live that and really feel like it is real for you, then it starts to become real in your physical reality mm. faster. So the fact that they like did the groundwork, did the hustle, had their heads down every day, just grinding, making it through, but also dreamed so big that great things did happen for them occasionally, then that was like the thing that kept me, that I I feel I learned the most from them. (laughs) You know? I do. I dig it. Keep on dreaming big. All you can do is <laughs> not make it. You know what I mean? Like, okay, at least you got you you putting food on the table. The electric bills paid, and there were times when it wasn't. You I know, tell me about it. I and there know. were times I was thinking about to my mom cooking. You know, neck bones on the stove in the bedroom, like a gas stove, mm-hmm. kerosene stove, because the you know power bill wasn't paid, and I would be like, man. They didn't pay the bill again. It's cold. <laughs> you know, she'd be cooking. We didn't know that we were broke, you know. I do know. They never let us know we were broke. We had a mentality of we're going to we're always successful. That's right. You know. We're going to make it. And what happens in the mind and in this imaginary realm is so important. What we're putting in there and how we're constructing right. things and what the vision is there, That's you know. Right. So because they gave us that vision and the power to use that then and they also gave us the hustle and the drive to use our bodies and and legwork to make things happen, then I feel like they set me up. You know, I know I hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to say that's the black family, but that's every family for the most part. Yeah. So you can't you can't just say it's one. That's the American dream, mm-hmm. and it's the truth. Most most of us are still living it. I have to ask you this though: Are you still eating them neck bones? It's been a long time since I had neck bones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time. I, honestly, I don't think I could eat them without her barbecue sauce. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> she makes some good homemade barbecue sauce. I, ooh, I hear that. Because so. I was about to say, I'm going to have to call the missus and have you come over for dinner. Because we stopped eating meat, but we will make some neck bones in a second if you come over. <laughs> that is so funny. It's been years. I stopped eating meat, but then I started again because I needed to for my health. But mm-hmm. I stopped eating it at about for about ten years, and wow. and then I started just. I mean, I needed to eat it, so it just depends. But usually, I just eat kind of lighter meat, you know. No, I understand. Let me ask you a question. Out off music and all of this health, right? Because health is extremely important to be a vessel and 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 do your calling, your anointing. What? Uh, first, I want to ask you, how did not eating meat almost um, hinder your health, if I ask that correctly? I'm trying, you know, don't want to dig too deep into your personal business, you know. Well, I was, uh, I didn't realize that I was diabetic. And when you're a vegetarian, you depend a lot upon, like, potatoes and rice and starches to feel full. Mm-hmm. And so I was eating all the things the starches, as well as grains and stuff. But to feel full, you put some rice with it. You know what I mean? Or some (laughs) beans, which are even, everything has sugar, but the things that are starchy have more. So so the beans that I was eating, I'd be like, I'm eating beans. Why is my blood sugar going (laughs) high? You know, because that is also a carb, you know? Right. And so like, and then fruit, I was heavy into fruit. Start the day with a, an amazing, healthy smoothie. That's right, and then that's move right. right into some salad and then go into a beans and rice for dinner or something like that. I, and I know that, <laughs> n- that is like 90% sugar. Wow. The only thing on that palate that wouldn't be heavy sugar would be like, 
the leafy greens and maybe cucumbers, raspberries are lighter in sugar. But there's only a few vegetables that are super light in sugars right. and fruit right. that's super light in sugar. And then I had like tons of nuts, but that didn't make me feel full enough. Of course not. <laughs> so I was leaning on potatoes and things like that, quinoa and, you know. So then when you become diabetic, you're like, wait a minute. I don't really need to have so much rice or so many, like, um, so much quinoa or, you know, that's actually not healthy for my body right. to have too much of that stuff. Like, a regular-sized portion is too much for me. So I eat it, but I eat a smaller portion. And, you know, then in order to make sure that I'm full, I'll eat a little chicken or, like, a little turkey or something like that and most of my plate is leafy greens and vegetables and fruit most of the plate is that so if you look at a plate of food usually half of it is a salad and the rest is like two small handfuls of of the carb (laughs) and the meat and that'll be what I'm eating because that's what's going to keep my sugar from going too crazy and it still goes crazy (laughs) (laughs) so I take insulin you know wow and I need to be able to enjoy my life and if there's a birthday cake there have a little piece you know or especially if it's chocolate oh yeah (laughs) chocolate cake because my my biggest uh the thing that gets me the most, not only chocolate, but chocolate, chocolate chip, haagen Yummy. Oh. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> <laughs> that gets me. I, I could talk to you for hours, but I do not want, because I know you have to go. I'm boarding the plane again tomorrow, so I got to go repack the, unpack and repack. Unpack and repack. <laughs> wow. Life on the road. Is that, do you enjoy it? Most days. Good. Yeah. Some days I'm like, wait a minute, what are we doing? <laughs> Other days I'm like, yeah. It's funny when I get to the airport sometimes and I look up at the sign that has every city that you could go to. And I get there and I'm like, I know I'm supposed to be here and we're leaving at 7, but where am I going? Wow. Because I've, <laughs> I've been going and going and going. Going and going. going. <laughs> Real quick, it because most people don't know, once it's on, it's really, really on, right? So it goes from the once a month performances to the twice a month to if you're lucky enough to once a week, and then you know, it, and then it it goes to the well, you're performing ten times this month in five different places in the world. <laughs> oh wow. Even you just saying that out loud right now, I'm like, dang, I guess you're right. <laughs> that still doesn't really sink in to me. Oh, wow. I'm so sorry. And let's take, let's rewind that. You're right. Oh, well, that's just, I guess you become a time traveler. Yeah, basically. You know, but it, I think it's, it's good, you know, but it, do you find time to relax? Well, okay, so... This is a funny thing that happened to me last night. I love taking baths, and I worked really hard yesterday just, like, organizing, cleaning, getting things ready. Because if I don't do that when I'm off, like, in my windows when I get home, then I'll just, I mean, the fridge will be backed up with bad food and (laughs) all of this stuff. So I'm super organized and clean. And, um... And I was, like, so tired at the end of running around and doing all these errands and cleaning and... I was like, okay, so now it's time to take care of me. Right. I'm going to do, like, a nice salt herb bath, and I'm going to get in there. I'm going to finish my book. And and then I got a text from my boyfriend. He was like, oh, I'm coming home. The bath was just about to be finished, like, filling. I'm coming home, and I need a shower really bad because I worked all day, and I'm dirty. And I was like, dang, I'm just <laughs> I'm <laughs> like trying to relax. Dang, I gotta get. I have to make this a fast one, you know. Yes. Because when you share space, you know. So I, baths yeah, and <laughs> things like that are healing, and yes. I feel like they rejuvenate me, and I try to do as many as I can. <laughs> yes, well, it actually does, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are you reading right now, by the way, if you don't mind me asking? I just finished um, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. 
Wow. And it's really great. And you should read it. I, I will. <laughs> that was the last thing I expected to say, bro. <laughs> not, that it, not that I don't think you read something so, but that was just left field. Please explain, and I will read it. Well, it's just, it's talking about stars and existence, and uh, it gets really deep. But the biggest thing that I gather from it is just the whole idea that the universe and the multiverse is bigger than us, greater, greater, way greater. And life is precious because we don't know if it exists anywhere else in the whole yeah. <laughs> like universe or multiverse. We don't know. We don't. <laughs> wow. We don't know, you know. But yet we spend our time like dealing with things like trying to keep people from getting educated without being able to pay thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And then once they are educated, keeping them hustling. The so they're like, oh, right. you got to feed the kids. Oh, you got to da, 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 da. So like, and then, you know, time with people like just being in states of poverty, like it's it's time for Earth to elevate. Absolutely. And this is just talking about all of the different forms in which our minds could be expanding and through science, you mm. know. And, um, and how cool it would be if our concerns were more about, wow, um, how are we going to learn how to travel at the speed of light? Or how are we going to learn how to connect with, uh, like, live in other spheres? That's I mean, right. right now, I don't think we're ready to do that because I we don't. need to take care of our round ball. That's right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but if we could elevate to where we had this together, then, you the know, they say we don't even use most of our brains, you yes. know. So if it was getting, you know, more knowledge into our brains and in our world and more consciousness all around and our concerns became not how are we going to eat today. Right, but, but real concern. Yeah, you have to have time to think like that, you know, and yeah. you can't have time when you're being herded into the next Okay, this task, right. that task, just to pay bills, you know. I do. So <laughs> it, that really is just the working woman blues again. But oh, right now dealing with that, and then taking your mind out of that and thinking about like, well, okay, the sun's a star; it's not going to last forever. Okay, the Earth is. How does it survive without the sun? It doesn't. So we are small in it all, and. And our lives are so precious and so delicate and life in general is. And so having a respect for each other and a gentleness and a kindness for each other and creating that better and better world from that point and knowing that maybe humanity won't exist always, but we can at least make it gentler for those who are children now who will be That's living right. here after us and right. on and on and on. So... I mean, it's a deep book. It, it's deep in a short span. And one of the things I thought was neat about it was reading about how everything has a chemical fingerprint. And it was talking about how light um, for each thing is different, you know. Really? And I always think about that in, in a spiritual sense of, okay, I feel like I have a light inside me. And I feel like other people... Each person has a light and that you were born with this light and that you came to earth to shine it and to give it. And so if you did come here and you do have an individual light like a fingerprint, then your light is so needed and necessary mm. because it's so different from everybody else's. And so when I read that, I was like, oh, God, you mean that it really made me feel like it's true that. It's not just in my head that each person does need to shine and that we do need to move towards our path and believe in ourselves and not get caught in the everyday Hustle so much. Bustle. Yeah. Right. Almost as um, that can be equated to being an artist. And they always say, be who you are as an artist because we already had one, this one. Right? Yeah. And it's wow. a, and it also makes it so inevitable. You can't be anybody else. No. <laughs> you got to do you. You got to do you. So that book is getting really good. <laughs> wow, okay. I got to take a look at it. Got you. Okay. All right. That's producing. That's what I'm talking about, boy. <laughs> yeah.
Um, wow, that's groovy. Any last things you want to share or say to the good folks in regards, matter of fact, even better, up and coming artists or up and coming anyone? What would you like to share with them? Any advice or suggestions? <laughs> inspiration I woke up today and I I wrote in my journal just I felt like you know I have a lot of work to do (laughs) and that it was bigger than me today I was just like wow there's so much to do and (laughs) I'm not gonna get it all done today I'm just not (laughs) so so then it just came to me that the work is the job is in the doing like it's not necessarily in the the work minimizing or you getting the work to where it's smaller and holdable it's like no this is your life path and what you have to do is just to wake up and work at it just chisel at it like it's um a sculpture and you just work at it each day shaping it and molding it the way you wish for it to look like and you'll do that for every day for the rest of your life if you're lucky you yeah. know <laughs> and so making that the vision not to like I'm just gonna wipe all of this work out and be done no it's just like I'm gonna keep working at it every day developing it getting better at it for me you know, because better is relative if other people are involved. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, just better at what you see in your mind's eye. And then you'll wake up and you'll have lived a great life, hopefully. But how small a life he is, you know. Yeah, in the big scheme of things. Yeah. Right, but you gave your all. You left this mark. Yeah. Beautiful, right? <laughs> I'm, no, I'm very serious. I'm really, really happy you came. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> why, why is ah! <laughs> Just thinking about time and and things of that sort. Yes, you know? yes. But it, it was wonderful. And hopefully someday in the future we can either do it again or even better perform together. That'll be that's that'll be great. Well where are you performing next? Like I'd like to see you play. You will. I will definitely let you know the next time I perform. I don't even know. <laughs> well um let me know. I'll be around some in the fall and some in the winter. But besides that, I'll probably be gone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. God knows which town. No, I'm on tour in November and then again in February. Oh. So, yeah. All right. And we, we will let y'all know where she's going. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Thank you all.